So the title of my talk is uh, What is the UC Irvine Data Science Initiative? So I'm going to talk a little bit about data science in general and our philosophy about it here at UCI, and uh, then talk a little bit more specifically about what the initiative is doing. So we live in a, a, an era when data is, is very plentiful. You're going to hear this thing all afternoon. In fact, the reason most of you are here is because we're well aware of this. And just one example, um, if we're looking at time along the x-axis here, and uh, we're looking at the y-axis on a log scale as bits per dollar. So uh, how much you can buy for your dollar in terms of bits, you know, uh, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 12, as a function of time. And this is, since it's on a log scale, this is exponential growth. So this is like Moore's law, but for data storage. And some of us in this room are old enough to have been doing research back around here when our dollar didn't buy very much. And we the, the idea of storing every piece of data that we could see wasn't practical. Now with grad students and, and uh, you know, in modern times, uh, well, this is a little out of date, but uh, we can pretty much store everything. Memory is, is almost free. And um, you know, this data storage is just one aspect of this, this revolution in uh, technology. Uh, sensors, before we store the data, of course, are, are increasingly cheap and ubiquitous. Our mobile phones have a tremendous number of, of cheap sensors. We just talk about data storage, which has had the impact that everybody owns data. Everybody is a data owner now and wants to do something. In parallel with that, with uh, Moore's Law, computational power, we can, we can do a lot of computation on the data. Data analysis methods, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, perhaps not quite keeping pace with the technology, but more to do on that front. And the role of the internet as well, uh, hugely important. So in areas like genomics or climate, you can now download combined data. And again, many of us in the room are old enough to remember back in the 1970s, 1980s, when getting data meant sending a letter to somebody in the other coast and waiting for a tape to come back in a very, very different world which you can do with data analysis. So the world has changed fundamentally in terms of looking at data. And this convergence has created a tremendous demand. Um, we get attendees here from all across campus, um, and that's typical of what's going on in the world in general. Everybody is interested in doing something with data. Historically, uh, data analysis was the province of statisticians, primarily. And this just doesn't scale up. We love our statisticians, but there aren't enough of them, and there won't be enough of them. We just can't uh, make anybody a statistician. And, and even statisticians, even if we had lots of statisticians, they still need a computer to analyze a lot of this data. So in some sense, data analysis has, has grown beyond statistics departments and is a broader enterprise. And that's one of the key things that I think you're going to hear today, uh, that statistics is a core piece of data analysis, but often not sufficient on its own. Now, if we think about computers, bringing computers into the picture along with statistics, the historical meaning of the word computer is you know, a person who computes. Um, and statisticians uh, were well aware of this. They've been using computers for centuries. Carol Pearson, for example, in London had teams of, of ladies that would pass pieces of paper around and do calculations. And, and this is very clever, but um, sort of distributed computing with people as the nodes. Uh, but these human computers, it doesn't scale up. Uh, it still could only work. So the theory was running ahead of what, what could actually be analyzed in terms of, of, of data. Um, post World War II, after the dramatic advances in, in uh, technology, and then the development of digital computers, statistics was an obvious area to apply uh, computing ideas. And so the use of computers to do the algorithmic aspects of, of uh, statistics increased. Uh, after a little while, the whole notion of statistical computing and ideas like exploratory data analysis using computers started to become uh, in, in vogue. And then uh, in more mainstream statistics, computing allowed statisticians to explore more flexible models, to abandon maybe the traditional very simple linear models and move on to more complicated things. So ideas like non-parametric methods, simulation-based methods, and Bayesian techniques that you hear about. Um, the 1990s, uh, you know, again, not enough statisticians, computer scientists started to jump into the, into the, the game. An area called machine learning that Pierre Baldi will tell you about, very flexible predictive modeling techniques. And this developed somewhat independently of, of what was going on in statistics, but by today, the distinctions between statistics and computer science in the data analysis area are, are often blurred. And, and there's a lot of collaboration. We have statisticians and computer scientists sitting beside each other, and they're not arguing or, or anything like that. Um, now, when computers were first uh, proposed to do data analysis, it, 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 was, it came with some controversy. So this is a paper from uh, Social Sciences 
uh, entitled Alchemy and the Behavioral Sciences. And there were quite a few papers written like this, that it was very dangerous to let a computer loose looking at data. Um, and and there's, there's some truth to that. Uh, one does have to be careful. So, you know, the, the idea here, the role of theory in research has been dangerously ignored in favor of purely empirical work that proceeds without so much as a hypothesis. Now, you know, we understand that we can't always have a hypothesis going into data analysis, but uh, nonetheless, it's, it's important for data analysis to respect what, what theory is there, and, and to be aware that data can sometimes fool you, and we would see some examples. In fact, uh, here's one of my favorite ones, um, where uh, you can go to this website and take uh, time series from uh, the census and from CDC in this case, and it finds a very high correlation. This is very simple-minded between uh, these time series of people who drowned falling out of boats and marriage rates in Kentucky. And the correlation is 0.95. I mean, this is silly, but I'm just illustrating the point that data alone can lead to very silly conclusions. We can get even higher correlations if we look at skiing facilities and people uh, getting tangled in bed sheets. This is not my data. This is uh, coming from CDC and so forth. One you may be aware of is, uh, you know, this got a lot of publicity, chocolate consumption in different countries versus number of uh, Nobel laureates per 10 million in your population. And of course, there, there's some underlying causal factor here, perhaps, like GDP of a country that may be leading to this correlation. Um, but more seriously, this actually does occur in the real world. It's not just silly examples like this. We're all aware of many medical studies where you pick some, you know, something like coffee and you say, okay, uh, it leads to depression in twins and you know, all these different combinations. So there is a danger as we search more with computers that we will find uh, patterns that perhaps don't generalize that are apparent in data. Now, one phrase that's used here, you might say, well, why not use big data? Why not, you know, if we have lots of data, then, then it won't matter. I, I'm not a fan of the term big data, and apologies to later speakers, because I know many of them have the phrase big data in their uh, talks. But I think it, it sometimes misses the point, it, it, apart from the fact that it's, it's somewhat overhyped and so forth in the uh, commercial world. Uh, if we take climate just as one example, this also applies to medicine and many other areas, it, it, it's, it, it appears that we have a lot of data. So here's you know, lots of different satellites, and Jim Randerson will tell you about some of his work in this area later, producing billions of measurements, pixels spatially over time, high resolution, we have simulations. It, it, it appears we have huge amounts of data in climate. So you would say this is definitely a big data area. A different way to look at this is if we just look at the time series. And a lot of the changes we're interested in are on annual time scales. And so this is just projections of, of uh, temperature change over the next 100 years. And one way to think about it is the amount of data we have is about the last 50 years or so. Good data that we have each year. So we have a time series of about 50 measurements and we're trying to extrapolate from that. And, and of course, you wouldn't do that just with the data alone. You need theory, you need a lot of physics, a lot of chemistry. So it's, it's just, the point I'm trying to get across here is that when somebody says big data, and that they might be telling you about this, you, you want to think about what are the units, what's really important here. So this also comes up in medicine, where the number of individuals in a clinical trial, perhaps, is quite small, even though per individual we're getting a lot of data. So where does this put us? What, what do we think of as data science? So these are my own personal views, but I'm, uh, I can get, agree with a lot of my colleagues on this. Um, I think at the core are ideas like statistics, and we'll hear about optimization later, and techniques like machine learning. These are mathematical in nature, uh, sort of the core algorithms that have been used to analyze data. To do this, you need, of course, uh, systems, databases, what we think of as computing. We have to do it on, on uh, silicon, uh, using al algorithms and so forth. And the other aspect of this that I think we sometimes, in, in the, on the technology side, tend to underestimate, is the human aspect, decisions, policy, privacy, and so forth, increasingly important with many of the data sets that we look at. And in fact, there's a very nice flow here if you look at these three pieces, going from data to models and predictions to the human aspect. And one of the nice things here at UC Irvine that is uh, unique as far as I know is that if you think of this as the computer science department, this as statistics, and this as the informatics department, we, we have very nice coverage. It's not as quite as simple as that, but we have all of this expertise in one building next door in Bryn Hall, and which makes for some very nice synergies. Now, all of this on its own doesn't get us anywhere. Um, all of this data analysis happens in the context of some particular problem, um, so whether it's science, medicine, engineering, humanities, business, and so forth, which is why, with the Data Science Initiative, we have essentially the core technologies, if you like, the core concepts, and then we have a broad array of people involved from across campus who are at the, you know, the, the uh, of doing data analysis. 
So the challenges in, in data science are, are many. Uh, I'll just mention a few. If we're thinking as statisticians, one of the interesting things is the data is often observational rather than a random sample. It's not the ideal type of data we would like to get. And there are other interesting things like how can we balance the data with, with maybe partial, partially incomplete theories? Uh, I think there's a lot more to be done there. Uh, the algorithmic aspects on the computing side, scalability is a very big issue. Mike Carey will talk about that. Um, and things like updating models automatically as you get new data these are very interesting issues. The human and sociocultural aspects are becoming ever more important. Uh, privacy and data usage. Um, and I think tools also to allow people like scientists to look inside these black boxes, these predictive models. There's more we can do there. And on the education side, which I'll talk about what we're doing in, in data science in a few minutes, there really is a shortage of people, young people coming out with the right skills uh, that understand particularly both the statistical and the computational side of things. So just a little bit on uh, each of these. Uh, we often think of data, we put it into matrix form or a two-dimensional array. So we can think of the shape of data, where this is the number of samples, perhaps the number of individuals in a medical study, and this is the number of variables, the number of measurements. So we have an N by D matrix of measurements. And if you think of data over time, what, what's been going on is, you know, sort of pre-1990, roughly speaking, we're looking at relatively small matrices. So small number of rows, small number of columns. This is kind of the traditional classical statistic of a relatively small data set. And it's interesting, the sort of first dimension where things got big, if you like to use that word, uh, it, it, it's one way of thinking about it is in the, the number of variables. And, and genomics in particular was one area where you might have six or 10,000 genes and a relatively small number of biological uh, samples, individuals, or mice, and uh, And so some very interesting work on how do you figure out which of these variables are relevant in, in terms of making predictions. And of course, in more recent times, our matrices have scaled in both dimensions. We have tremendously large numbers of you know, samples and also very high dimensional data. This data is often very sparse in many applications. Um, and this, this poses challenges. The large N generally is a good thing, uh, statistically. It gives us more power. Uh, but the large high dimensionality can be a real challenge, both statistically and, and computationally. So these are some of the things that you'll hear more about later on when you're thinking about these matrices. It's very high dimensional matrices. When I say large here, this might be thousands or even minutes. Uh, and of course, this also in minutes. A little bit about on the computing side. Um, why do we need to think about algorithms and databases and things like that? Mike is going to tell us uh, exactly why in a few minutes. But uh, let me just give you one example that I like to give, which is you have your CPU doing the actual computation. Uh, you have your main memory. And you have stuff out on disk, say magnetic disk. Um, so your, your data is kind of maybe split between main memory and disk. It won't all fit in main memory. Now, roughly speaking, and these slides are a little out of date, Main memory, we can get a random piece of information in about 10 to the minus 8 seconds, and disk about 10 to the minus 3. There's a, let's say it's a, a moving head disk, a traditional disk. So that's a 10 to the 5 difference uh, in speed in accessing the information. And if we think of this in terms of distance, uh, RAM is from, from me to the first row here. I can walk over, get the piece of data, bring it back, and do some computation. The disk is in San Diego. I have to walk to San Diego and get the piece of data. But that's the time. It's 10 to the 5 longer. That's the time scale we're thinking about. And that's why we, with very large data sets, you do need to think carefully about where the data physically sits, pipelining it through the CPU. So these issues become very important when you go to the larger data sets. Um, this is a slide on, on, on the, the human, political, sociological aspect of, of data. Uh, this was produced by the data from the US Department of Commerce. And it's about sort of how restrictive uh, the legislation is on, on what kind of data you can collect. So it's essentially some countries like Germany and Argentina have a lot of privacy laws and others, uh, I won't mention names, but uh, are much looser. And it's, uh, depending on your point of view, it's a bit ironic then that, uh, you know, the, the uh, Office of the President has a, has a, a recent um, a publication out study on uh, essentially data privacy. So this is, this is an area that's going to continue to become more and more important. And uh, we're fortunate, again, to have in, in the data science initiative some folks who are very knowledgeable in this, this general area. All right, so what is the initiative specifically? I've talked in very broad terms. Um, this is, as uh, Al Bennett just mentioned, this is one of the uh, five currently funded initiatives starting in July 1. And I think uh, Al covered this very nicely, but uh, there's these initiatives involve research, education, outreach, and intended to have a wider range of activities that are typically supported, say, by organizational research units. And teams of engaged faculty, many of whom are here today and would be producing new uh, 
Excellent stuff. So on our website, we uh, tried to come up with a reasonable definition of what is this thing data science. Um, and this is our best uh, go at it. Uh, the full spectrum of theories and methods to use data to understand and make predictions about the world around us. Fundamental research in statistical methods, prediction algorithms, data management techniques, and policy issues. So you're going to see that uh, earlier this afternoon, each of these areas. Plus the broad range of domain-specific uh, data-driven research problems that crop up increasingly in, in all of the schools across campus. Um, to, to put this into practice, we have a, a, a really terrific faculty advisory board. In fact, I was spoiled for choice. I, I had to make choices. We pretty much tried to get one person from, from each school. Uh, ICS is a little bit of an exception because we, we have statistics and computer science and informatics. Uh, but up here, you should, most of you should see somebody from your school, uh, and these are the people, in a sense, the point people for contacting with uh, about the data science initiative. So these folks are working with me. These are the folks to go to if you have ideas, if you want to see things done, go chat with them, they'll come to me, or at least see, see them on your emails to me and so forth. What are we actually doing in, in, in year one? Uh, we're organizing many symposia, uh, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. We're doing short courses primarily aimed at graduate students. We have a very exciting data science undergraduate major proposal that's going through the system right now. This is a dual emphasis on statistics and computer science, addressing that educational issue, that gap that I mentioned earlier. And we are planning to have a, a minor uh, later on so that folks in physics or social sciences can do a, a minor in data science. Um, other things we're doing, if somebody comes to me and says, I want to do a huge new proposal uh, that combines statisticians and environmental people and something else, and I need some help, Please talk to me about that. I'm, I'm happy to support that kind of effort. Kind of a clearinghouse through our mailing list and website, and we're, we're in the process of doing more stuff. We only started July 1, so uh, there's, there's kind of a ramp up time. The website is the place to go. So it's very simple data science at UCI at uh, We're going to do our best to keep this updated with seminars and events. I just heard about an exciting speaker coming from Stanford, Emmanuel Candace, uh, who's a noted matrix factorization guy. The mathematics department is hosting him, but we're going to broadcast it here so we get word out. So that's exactly the kind of thing I want to hear from people. We can help get the word out about you know, what's going on in mathematics, which would give broad interest to other people across campus. What are the short courses I mentioned? These are coming up very soon. Uh, in fact, the deadline is November 1st uh, to apply. And uh, we have one introduction to R. R is a statistical programming language, if you don't know what it is. If you don't know what it is, come to this workshop, it would be perfect. Uh, two uh, that are going to be taught um, in conjunction with the High Performance Computing Center. Um, and uh, they're on the 17th and the 18th. So those are uh, already scheduled. Um, I should say, Already, we're oversubscribed for these, but uh, please continue to apply. We're going to, uh, on November 1st, we go through and, and uh, um, uh, assign people to the, the various classes. We'll rerun these. Uh, we're going to rerun them again. So if you don't get in the first time, this is for grad students primarily. You'll, you'll get in the second time. I say grad students, they're the primary audience. Um, of course, postdocs, faculty, research staff, uh, if we have room, if we can fit you in, we will do so as well. Uh, but the main audience there is graduate students. And, and the, the thinking is to get, this is very practical kind of hands-on software stuff. These are open source software tools that are available and to just get them in the hands of not so much people like me that are sort of at the tail end of our career, but the new grad students that are going to do really cool stuff over the next 20 to 30 years. Um, we're, I have some students from uh, grad students helping a plan courses for next year. Uh, we have a lot of ideas. Some of these are further along than others. There's an exciting one, a two-day event with software carpentry that we're, we're, we're thinking about hosting. Uh, more advanced our courses. We want to do some stuff in Python. Uh, watch the website. There's more coming. So uh, I think this is going to be very exciting and hopefully very useful to our, our grad students. Kind of filling a niche between formal courses and practical stuff. The research mini symposia, these haven't really uh, been scheduled yet, but let me tell you what the plan is. The idea is a half to a full day on topics of relevance to data science, somewhat like today, maybe in this auditorium, but on a particular theme. So uh, roughly maybe once per quarter, maybe twice per quarter. In the planning mode right now, we have one um, on social network analysis, combining statistical and algorithmic and social science modeling. This is quite a nice. Uh, effort between social science, statistics, and computer science, and this is tentatively in mid-March. Uh, it's been scheduled. There's another one uh, with Mark Borchardt in education. There's a lot of interest in data analytics in, in education, and that is currently uh, being discussed. 
and uh, the business school is also planning to do one. So if you're a faculty member up there and you're thinking, I want to do one of these too, let me know. Let me know soon, because uh, you fill up for uh, spring and, and winter, and then you can start thinking about fall as well. So additional topics under consideration, but uh, we're interested in hearing from you. Um, we also need you guys to participate. This is a campus-wide effort, but there's only so much uh, we can do. And so how can you participate? I know that's why many people came today and people have sent me emails. Well, you know, the website, we have a mailing list, uh, attend these types of events. The short courses, particularly if you're a grad student, strongly encourage you to sign up for, for ones of interest. You might even tell us what new short courses we're missing. Uh, perhaps even some of you can volunteer to teach a short course. I know we have a lot of skills out there. Um, the mini symposia, you might propose one. You might even help organize one. Uh, if there's a topic you think is particularly timely, let us know. Uh, and particularly the person in your school uh, that's on the faculty advisory board. Um, Grant proposals, as I mentioned earlier, if you're looking for collaborators and have an idea, uh, please let us know and I'll try to make it happen and make connections. Uh, and in general, any kind of ideas. We're, we're just right now, we're just ramping this up. So we're, we're not at the stage yet where we're kind of uh, so busy that we don't have time to do anything else. Let me mention a few things we don't have that I get questions about all the time. I do not have 10 faculty positions open for hiring. Uh, the initiative did, did not come with that. We have a different mechanism for doing that. Uh, talk to Al or somebody else. Uh, I do not have hardware. Uh, we, we decided in the first year at least we're not going to get involved in infrastructure. Uh, OIT is doing you know, a great job in, in that respect. And um, so we're, we're not buying hardware. So that's just something we're, we're just not doing. The, the management and all of that is, is, is just too much. Um, we don't really directly fund research projects, so we may fund, say, graduate students with summer fellowships, we're thinking about that for next summer, uh, interdisciplinary type of work, but I'm not going to find your favorite uh, research project. Uh, we're really more of a seed organization to get things going. And we don't really provide consulting support, I don't have the staff of people that provide consulting support, so we have the statistical consulting center for things like that. Alright, so back to today's event, and how are we doing on time, Kevin? Eight minutes, alright, we're actually ahead of time. Um, the way that I laid out the uh, afternoon of talks was pretty much in line with, with this uh, diagram here that I showed you earlier, where we have sort of the core statistics, machine learning ideas, we have the algorithms, and we have the human aspect of it. So you can have data, models, human aspects. And uh, Hal Stern uh, from statistics and Kyo Baldi from computer science will be our first two speakers and will tell us about uh, statistics and machine learning, respectively. Recent advances and really exciting stuff. Um, Mike Carey is going to convince us that we should all be thinking about databases and data management, where the data physically sits. One of the, the world's experts in, in uh, database systems. Very happy to have him here. And Jeff Barber will, I don't know what Jeff's going to talk about exactly, but uh, privacy and personal aspects of data, which as I keep mentioning is, is increasingly important. Um, the second session uh, will be more applications focused. We're going to have talks about text analysis, particle physics, engineering, genomics, the environment, and business. I apologize in advance to the speakers. I give them 10 minutes, which I know is not nearly enough to talk about your research. But again, the idea today was to give you an idea of the, really the, the breadth and diversity uh, of research going on on campus in different schools involving data analysis. So uh, just reviewing the schedule here, uh, Coming up on two, so we'll start the data science principles session uh, with Hal, Pierre, Mike, and Jeff. Uh, some time for uh, questions and discussion at the end. And at 3:30, we'll take a short break for 15 minutes, and then come back for an hour. And um, we'll have this uh, fast set of 10-minute talks uh, with a little bit of time at the end for, for, for questions. And then don't forget, at 5 p.m., uh, we have a reception with food and, and beverages. Uh, and uh, that's actually quite important. We do want to encourage people to network and talk and make connections. So please, if you can, stay around for that, talk to the speakers, try to introduce each other people, but uh, stick around for five o'clock. You might, you know, it's a long afternoon, but uh, there's you know, the reception at five. So with that, uh, I think I will hand it over to Hal Stern for uh, his talk. Thank you.